I was with a couple of pals in the mid 70s, one of whom, Adrian, who later came to be called Nicky Sudden, I was at school with him and we were both kind of outcasts I suppose, we were both uh, shunned by the rest of the population so we gravitated towards each other and we ended up making some music together and his brother Kevin, uh, Epic, he joined in as well and uh, there were a couple of other people we um, hung around with like uh, David who called himself Phone Sportsman and um, that was the nucleus really the four of us there were a couple of people as well, like Richard and John. So uh, six of us operated as a kind of collective, a loose collective, and we all ended up on various tracks on the first uh, two albums. We were all inspired by different things. I mean, I was more into freaky stuff like Beefheart and Vandercraft Generator and. Uh, can. Uh, Nicky was into T-Rex in a big way and Epic was into prog stuff, you know, like Gong and um, so on. And uh, it was all these different things which it shouldn't have worked really, but it sort of did. We used to debate endlessly about the merits of certain uh, records or musicians. And, and the first thing that came out, you recorded your own single? Ah, yes. Read about Seymour. <laughs> yeah, we saved up uh, our various uh, tawdry day jobs and uh, we heard about somebody who had made a record on their own and it was quite an alien concept at the time. We thought uh, initially, well, don't you have to audition for a company if you want to make a record and sound professional and get a producer? But uh, I think uh, the, the inspiration was Buzzcock, Desperate Bicycles, their first record. And we thought, wow, we heard them on John Peel's show, of course. And we thought, wow, how, if they can do it, we'll have a go. Do you remember how much it cost? Oh, um, I've got the receipt somewhere. <laughs> we yeah. scribbled it all down somewhere. So that'll end up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at some point, that uh, receipt. Perhaps so, yes. So you headed down to Rough Trade, I presume, with a box of records. Well, huh? yes, that's right. Rough Trade took a couple of boxes, and then John Peel played it, and they all went. Wow. Who's buying this? You know, so Rough Trade asked for loads more, so we gave them nearly everything that was left, and we ended up repressing it again and again, and um, and the association with the Rough Trade built from there. It was a very fruitful partnership. So then you recorded an album for Rough Trade. Yes, we retained our independence because uh, we produced everything ourselves and we presented them with what we came up with and uh, I think for me anyway the our first album is our crowning achievement a trip to Marineville as uh, we produced so much ma material at this point uh, after we'd done a single and we reinvested what money we made out of the single in recording this album. And uh, it's, it was criticised in some quarters because the diversity of styles is quite mind-boggling, I suppose, to some people and quite um, perverse to some other people. But um, it was a summary of where our heads were at and the diversity of creative ideas flowing around between us. I mean we were into variously... Faust were a big influence on Swell Maps for example, Can, 
and uh, also the punk thing, you know, we like the Sex Pistols, Buzzcocks, that kind of thing. I remember at the time it was um, it came as, as something that was different because there was a lot of punk bands around at the time mm. and then suddenly here was an album that actually picked on lots of things that you kind of, oh yeah, I remember, as you say, Faust, Can, yeah. and it it, I think it kind of opened the floodgates for other people to say, well, actually, we don't just have to play three chords. We can be a bit more imaginative. Yeah. Well, the thing was, in 1976 and 77, it became fashionable to have a kind of ground zero kind of mentality about music. And anything before 76 was taboo. You couldn't even discuss it, you know. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we were quite, uh, we were quite, we were quite honest and frank about where we were coming from, and um, we didn't mind admitting that we listened to uh, hippies from Germany, you know, and uh, other people started to uh, ease up their opinions and. Uh, people started realising, yes, well, there was great music made before 1976. Yeah, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, how long did Swell Maps run its run for? Well, let's see, we released our first record at the beginning of 1978, made a, an album um, later that same year, uh, and uh, we made a second album. Jane from Occupied Europe, which took it a bit further, that was possibly more experimental. I don't really like comparing the two actually, because they're, they're very different in mood, and um, but they're both great albums I think, and I think they've stood the test of time very well. But uh, after the second album, um, the momentum started to pick up. We'd recorded three sessions for John Peel's Top Gear show by then and we were starting to get interest from abroad and uh, there was talk about us touring America and um, there was a certain assumption that we'd get more sophisticated and uh, more um, perhaps sophisticated is the wrong word, more more mature, perhaps more professional. Who, who had that assumption? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at Rough Trade the climate was changing there and um, I could see at the time people on the label, uh, it wasn't quite, there was more investment coming in and the equipment was getting better in some cases and the um, I remember, uh, oh, Stiff Little Fingers, that was hilarious. Stiff Little Fingers were very well thought of at the time and they released an album on Rough Trade after our first one. And uh, they, they decided that they'd had enough of all these amateurs at Rough Trade. And so they signed up for a major label, I think Chrysalis possibly. And their parting shot was, uh, we'd rather be on an, uh, a label with uh, professional bands, not uh, uh, amateurs like uh, Swell Maps, you know. And they singled us out for criticism. God. And, um, well, at the time I thought, well, goodbye, <laughs> good riddance, you know. And we did a tour of Italy, our very first tour together. And... Um, the cracks were showing by then and we weren't getting on quite so well and um, uh, suddenly it became like uh, we were doing this routine you know yeah all the experimentation from the studio using interesting instruments and um, a certain amount of subtlety and uh, you can edit things in a studio to present music in an in a, an interesting way uh, but live, you know, you've got a set list, often keep the set list same every night, you know, and uh, it's just guitars and it's really loud and uh, it became, for me, uh, it was starting to become rather frustrating. It must have been hard because there were people you grew up with. 
It was terrible. It was really agonizing decision to part. It was very difficult. So, so what did you move on to then? Well, I made an album called Pincer Movement, and there were hardly any guitars on it at all. <laughs> and uh, I found that a, a certain liberation, you know, all this space sonically opened up when, when I made that decision. And uh, I'm glad I made that record because it made me think about what to use apart from guitars. There's a world of sound out there and uh, it's very exciting to experiment with different sounds and just guitars, it's so limiting, it's so paralyzingly uh, obvious, really. I mean, uh, I like making music with instruments with strings on, you know, like these two. And uh, also uh, zithers, I really like zithers, they've got strings on, but that's a different kind of yeah. flavour, you know. I like um, hitting things, percussive <laughs> in instruments, like tuned percussion sometimes. And uh, I, I really like primitive sounds, and some people try to get less primitive and more sophisticated as they grow up but uh, I I still really like making music using very uh, using very primitive resources studio so I hear you did a, a a really intriguing cover version of a Joe Meek song oh uh, yeah set I hear a new world which is a strange song in its own right oh damn right yeah so what was the attraction of that well and Joe Meek was such an interesting character. He was, um, he had a couple of big hit records and he was uh, a, a phenomenal producer in the early 60s and he was rather a maverick and a lot of people in the music industry, it sounds like they didn't trust him and he was too awkward. But uh, he did have a, a magic touch and he, um, people uh, kind of suffered his eccentricity because he could make hit records, you know, and they're bloody weird sounding hit records, but uh, they're often kind of a bit out there, a bit kind of uh, strange, eerie sounds, like he invented his own reverb chamber using a, a gate spring, I believe, inside a chamber and uh, used electronics quite early on. And uh, Johnny Remember Me, that was a great hit he made. That's very, uh, that's very, uh, a great song, but it's got a very strange feel. It's rather morbid as well. That's a feature of his work. And um, yeah, Telstar, of course, huge hit record. And that's really out there, that's a bit like an English Sun Ra, <laughs> I suppose. That kind of um, celestial, um, alien nature almost. But so I hear a new world, that was the title track from a project that uh, was never re released during his lifetime. He, he worked really hard on a, a solo album, but it never got put out. He couldn't find anybody to release it. And sadly, he, um, he died under tragic circumstances, what was it, about 67, I think, 1967, where perhaps the tide of the music industry was turning a bit away from um, his kind of style, his, the way he liked to work. But uh, he was a very inspiring maverick, yes. But uh, I, whenever I do a cover version, I don't like to copy it at all. I like to try and do something different with it. And um, I try to be respectful, but I don't like to be too reverent, I suppose. That's a good mix. So in this case, I... I, I, I 
did my version of I Hear a New World and then I thought well it's quite short so I decided to glue on a Sun Ra song um, after a kind of bridge section which I hope works well. I think it works very well. So uh, how did you get involved with television personalities? Television personalities? Well our first Swell Maps single came out at almost exactly the same time as the first television personality single. We were both inspired by Buzzcocks and Desperate Bicycles to uh, have a go at recording and releasing our own singles. And so, of course, we were curious about these people down in London and eventually we got to meet them and I went with Nicky Sudden, our singer, to meet Dan at his mother's flat down on the King's Road in Chelsea in 1978 and Dan was probably boxing and sleeving some records or something at the time. Typical scenario. Uh, a hallway and a uh, living room full of boxes of records and um, we could relate to that of course <laughs> <laughs> and um, Dan was uh, ever so sweet and very welcoming and his mum was nice as well and um, and we felt a kind of empathy with him and uh, we encouraged him to start playing live so I he started doing one or two one or two cautious performances with his friend uh, Edward who helped him on the records and they recruited a drummer called Mark and uh, the first one I think was a very strange occasion because we got there and there were only two people on stage. There was the bass player and the drummer and uh, we thought, where's Dan? And uh, it seems that he had run off into the night and fled the building. Uh, there were d different versions of the story. Either he'd got extreme stage fright, or somebody had spiked his drink with LSD, or maybe it's a combination of the two factors, but uh, I never did quite find out. Um, I didn't like to talk about it with Dan, because he's obviously a, a difficult subject, but um, um, a few of us from Swell Maps who just happened to be in the audience, we got up on stage and sort of um, helped to um, entertain the crowd <laughs> because there's a large expectant audience there. So we did what we could to um, try and fill in. And uh, that would have been 1978. And uh, I, I got to really appreciate the... Um, the records as they went from strength to strength. Where is it? They could have been bigger than the Beatles. Here it is. A classic album, their first album on Rough Trade. And um, it was quite, it was very unusual at the time because um, there was obviously an influence of um, beat pop from the 1960s and nobody else was doing that then. Nobody else was referring to that era in pop. It was very unfashionable. And um, Dan started wearing paisley shirts and people used to go, paisley shirts? <laughs> what the hell? And um, Gradually, people started catching on to this, and it started to get. It took a long time, but people started uh, also playing jangly guitars, wearing paisley shirts. 
and um, of course uh, Alan McGee from Creation Records he's very frank about that he said that he was influenced a lot by what Dan was doing and uh, well doesn't it show <laughs> <laughs> and it triggered a, a whole psychedelic revival really not just over here but in the states as well and I think uh, Dan was a very important catalyst for that my personal favorite actually even more than that record is Mummy You're Not Watching Me. I love that record even, even more than the first one. This is the second Television Personalities album. And I used to think, wow, I wouldn't mind being in that band, you know. Well, what, what so impressed you about that record then? Uh, well, it's a bit more psychedelic. It's a bit more strange. It's a bit more... Um, there are a couple of... Uh, On the first album, and don't the kids just love it, there, there are, it's a bit more musically straightforward, and it's all guitars, and um, there are some very moving songs on there, but this one is just, takes it a bit further, it's got synthesizers on it, the arrangements are a bit more interesting, and there's a bit more kind of angst as well, even more angst. And uh, I really liked the the sound is a bit more developed as well. I won't say it's better produced, but uh, <laughs> that would be far too another, technical. That's another matter. But uh, I found it um, even more intriguing than the first one. And what do you know? About two years later, in 1983, uh, Mark Flunder left after a, uh, a difficult tour in Italy, which I heard about later, and uh, I got asked to join. And uh, I was pleased as punch. It was a great honour to be asked to join. They needed a bass player. Uh, so I said, yeah, thanks, all right, let's do it. And uh, I stayed for 10 years. <laughs> 